why do you think that you were the most assaulted man in prison history? Why did they pick you out? I think I was so small, and when I first got the birch for assaulting a officer, prison officer, and then come back for more and go it again, that made them determined to put me in my place. If I'd have been a big kid for my age, 12 stone, 11 stone, 5 foot 10 or 6 foot or 5 foot 9 even, they might have made them a bit wary, but I was so small, they thought, oh, the cockney little run, we're put him in his place. And unfortunately for them, I didn't want to be put in my place. And I always come back for more, I was greedy. What do you think was the worst beating that you ever underwent in prison? Well, I suppose two. The one at Exeter Prison, when we attacked the Governor and the Chief Officer, me and Jimmy Andrews, got knocked about so bad, took outside to Exeter and Devon General Hospital. Now, to be took from prison to an outside hospital smothered in cuts, bruises and abrasions, you've really been beaten up, really, especially in 1959. And the uh, Member of Parliament, Captain Mark Hewitton, for a constituency in Hull, he took me case up. Terrific guy, come to Exeter to see me, made me strip off all the bruises and cuts and everything, and he raised the motion in the House of Commons, which only happens two or three times a century, and I'm one of them, I'm happy to say. And the other one, I suppose, Parkhurst Prison in the riot. When the doctor was asked, was Fraser covered from top to toe with cuts, bruises and abrasions? I had 60 stitches in the head, both legs broke, every rib broke. He said yes, he was, from top to toe, except for here, the abdomen. For some reason he left that out. And even the judge, when he sentenced me, he said, but for the most severe injuries you got, I would have given you a lot longer. But it was a great riot. When you were out of prison, you carried out attacks on prison officers' homes. Tell us about that. Yes, I did. I bombed all the prison officers' houses. Wandsworth, Pentonville, Brixton. The one I let myself down, I didn't get round to Wormwood Scrubs. But the General Secretary at the Prison Officers Association, Christmas, 1963, I think. I'd found out where he lived, and I was gonna bomb that. But unfortunately, it was impossible. One of the regrets I have in life. But L.B. Woods, this lovely man, he was with George Cornell the day that Ronnie shot him dead. He was with me and he drove me home to Brighton so I'd had my first Christmas home with my youngest son. He got me home in time about four or five in the morning so that when he woke up I was there already. I'll never forget that but my regret, regret was I couldn't bomb that house. Particular difficulty with officers at, at Durham prison, what were they like, what happened? They were ferocious. 1953 there was a riot at Wandsworth Prison and I was immediately transferred to Durham. And when I got there, one of the worst beatings I've ever had, they literally slung the ones with prison officers out in the reception. And they were all lined up. And a big burly prison officer behind a Charles, old Charles Dickens desk, open desk. In name, Francis Davidson Fraser. In name, in his Geordie voice, he wanted me to say, sir, no way. And as he said it again, I just managed to get one punch in and that was it. They really done me then, really. Later on, I'm over the hospital. The doctor's put 27 stitches in me head and he's gone to the sink to put some old fashioned cat gut that you had in then. And while he's there, a prison officer is doing me with a wet towel right round the face. She just looked over his shoulder at the doctor <laughs> and then come put more stitches in. And the one who done me with the towel, 
about three years later, he was nicked for murder, killed his little daughter, but got it knocked down at manslaughter, I mean. Um, now, you were the first person to get a prison officer convicted. Um, yes. What did you do? Or what did he do? This prison officer is at Wakefield. His name was Douglas Hamilton. And he sent my sister a Christmas card, 1970. The most filthiest card you could ever, ever oh, dream of. I never knew. My family never told me about it. Thank God they never, because I'd have killed him. Because I was having a feud with this officer. He was a real animal. Had about 14, 12 or 14 years service in, so he was no rookie. But he also nicked the record, hospital record, and tried to upset me there about something. And without going into it, it's a very, very long story. But in September 1970, a detective inspector and a detective sergeant, they come to see me at Wakefield Prison in the hospital, and they told me they'd nicked him. And they showed me this card, the most filthiest card I've ever seen. They said they'd nicked him, and they're going to nick at least five more prison officers. I said, no way. I don't want him nicked. Don't want nothing to do with him. I'm happy that I've been proved I've been telling the truth about him, of the vindictive things against me he's got up to, and my family. He said, nothing you can do about it, he's nicked. But the other five, we want your cup nick. I said, no way. They were very fair, because they said, look, we're not prison officers from Wakefield. We're from Huddersfield, in the Yorkshire Regional Crime Squad. But we're not from Wakefield, we're from Huddersfield. They were genuine. And they, he pleaded guilty at Wakefield Magistrates Court, November 1970, with the card and various other things. And of course, got the sack. Yeah. Um, do you think it's a general And question? that's fact, by the way. It's yeah. the first, something that's been going on for years in prison. What prison officers have done, not only to me, to many other prisoners with their family, cards and all that. But that was the, and he pleaded guilty. That was the first time anyone's ever been actually convicted of it. And, and do you think that, that prison officers have ever sort of killed people in prison? Yes, definitely. I wish I had a pound note for every prisoner that's been killed in prison. I'd have quite a few pound notes. Um, you had regular street fights as a child. What was that like? Well, in the street where we lived, Harley Terrace, Harley Place, right where the Royal Festival was, nearly all docks there then, and all the fights occurred at the top of our street. And I had some wonderful fights there. One guy, I remember, fought him on a Sunday, in no school then, all day. After breakfast, after dinner and after tea, both our faces were out here. Terrific fights though, wonderful. That's where we always had them. And I, I believe that you, you attacked, the, for the first time, a, a screw in, in Rochester, Boston. Well, why was that? I had been down the punishment block and down the punishment block, same as the ball stall, you had to have a cold shower every day, every morning. But once a week, you was entitled to a bath, but not down the punishment block. You couldn't have one, just a cold shower. And when I come up from the punishment block, I've been down there about three weeks, I asked the officer in the wing I was in, could I have a bath? He said, why don't you have one before? I told him about the punishment block. He said, I'll check up, see if you're telling the truth. Come back, he said, yes, you are telling the truth. He said, in silent now, that meant you were locked in your cell. I mean, you finished work till six o'clock, you had your meal in there. And then you was unlocked for association for about an hour or so. And locked me in silent now. He said, you can go up and have a bath now, don't be long. Up I went to the end of the wing. And the war was on 1941. Around the bath, throughout the war effort, they painted a red line so it could only have that much water to help conserve fuel thing. 
Anyway, he kept coming in, this prison officer, Nippy Hurst, his name. Come, hurry up, Fraser, have that bath. Oh, he wore little shorts then, and a towel they'd give you was like canvas, you slid off your butt. This other prison officer kept coming in. His name was O'Connell. Called him Holy Joe, because his theory in life was to punish the body and save the soul. But actually, he was kinky, in my opinion. That word didn't exist then, but now he kept coming in. Come on, Fraser, out of that bath, hurry up, hurry up. Little shorts on, drying myself. And all of a sudden, right out of the blue, I swore. He, Come on, hurry up. I said, bollocks. And he gave me a terrific punch. Bosh. And lucky for him, I was a very fit young kid. Nothing of me, a fag paper would have been proud of me. I was on him, and I slung him in the bath, and I tried to drown him. Well, you had more chance of winning the lottery. There was only that much water in him. And he's screaming out for help. He knocked him unconscious. In seconds, I'm joined him. I'm unconscious. And that's when I was charged with gross personal violence to the officer, O'Connell, and got sentenced to 18 strokes of the birch, 15 days number one diet, 42 days number two diet and PCFO, penal class, until further orders and 14 nights, no mattress. That was the most you could get. It was a great, uh, great time though, it was a lovely punch. In the 40s and 50s, you were heavily involved in crime. What sort of jobs did you do? Well, for instance, during the war on one occasion, we'd be dressed up as air, air raid wardens, army army armband with it and you'd be in Hanover Square around that way a lovely furs women's fur shop you'd smash the window in you go especially if an air raid was on better still and people would see you loading the car up and say what's happening stand back sir stand back madam unexploded bomb in here and we're helping the man to get all the stock out before it goes off they would help you loading up it was wonderful. You were part of the, uh, the Friday game. Tell us about that. Yes, I invented that. Well, what used to happen then, no security van scene or anything like that. People at big works, factory or wherever, they went to the bank on the Friday and drew the money out for the men's wages. And it was by accident I sort of discovered this. I was in a bank one day and I see it. And the next week I went again, see it again. So the week after that, we we're ready for it. And we always had a newspaper van, the Star News or Standard, as there were three newspapers in London then. Oh, it was wonderful. When we come out, they come out with the money, just attacked them, took it off them. And in the newspaper van, which could go very fast, it was like customary, they were allowed to go fast. And they called us the Friday game, it was wonderful. I used to look forward to every Friday. You made a few mistakes when you were committing crimes. What happened to the jewellers in Oxford Street? On this occasion, in 1947, I'd just come out of prison, I'd only been out 10 days, and I said to my great mate, little Dodger Davis, is there anything buzzing, Dodge? I said, yes, a lovely jeweller's shop in Oxford Street, Frank. Smash and grab right. I said, is there plenty of jewellery in the window? He said, more than enough. Wonderful. I said, has it got a grill up? He said, no. I said, have you nicked a good moat? He said, a cracker, Frank. Put some false number plate on it. It's a really good goer. I said, right, we do it right away. Went to the garage where he had it got it out, pulled up outside the jeweller's shop. There was about 16 people looking in the window. A lot of soldiers who had been demobbed from the army, all got a few quid for their gratuity pay, buying their wives rings or whatever. He said, don't do it yet, Frank, too many people looking in the window. And we're sitting there, no yellow lines in or traffic wardens, but still a very busy street. All of a sudden, I look up as if we were reading the paper. There's only five, six, or seven people. I say, right, Dodge, 
I'm out of the car, I've got the bar of iron up my sleeve, I'm up to the window, excuse me sir, excuse me madam, they think I'm the window cleaner, they move out of the way, smash the window in, get the trays and rings and everything, I'm in the car in seconds. I said, straight on Dodge. He said, it won't go, Frank. I said, no jokes. He said, I'll shout it out, Frank. I did hear him shout out, Frank. I didn't hear the other words, not yet. Anyway, cut a long story short, we nicked. Headlines in the papers the next day, the two most incompetent thieves in London. They do a smash and grab raid in broad daylight and their car won't go. They deserve to get nicked. Even the judge at the Old Bailey had a smile. He said, society has nothing to worry from you two. Anyone who does a smash and grab raid in broad daylight in Oxford Street, one of the busiest streets in London, their car won't go, deserve to go to prison. He only gave me two years hard labour <coughs> and dodged 21 months. They certified me insane on that sentence again. They must have thought, we must be fucking mad to do a smash and grab raid that Carl won't go. It was great fun though. What about the, uh, the bank clerk in the New Kent Road? Yes, we've done, I've never, this again in the war, 1944. This bank clerk in the bank in New Kent Road, he put up a tremendous fight. The other two or three women, they were okay, but he fought like a tiger with the bag he had. Anyway, we got it, got away. You can imagine our disappointment when we opened it up, it had cheese sandwiches in it. Obviously, cheese was rationed in the war. You had a feud with Johnny Carter. What, what happened there? Yes, I knew Johnny Carter very well. And the Carter family had a feud with the Brindles, another famous family, very nice family and all. My sister married one of the Brindles, Jimmy, lovely man. And Carter was in Wandsworth with us, said, how do you stand, Frank? I said, well, I'm with the Brindles, because my sister's married to one. Things like that. They said, that's OK, Frank. It was all right, but he was brooding on it obviously. And in 1951, I was having a drink with him at a little club in Rupert Street off of Shaftesbury Avenue. And he leapt on me and stabbed me there, there and there. And got away. Ran downstairs, got away. I didn't even go to the hospital. My sister Eva got some sticky plaster and stuck it all together and it just let it heal up itself. And then I went looking for him. And Christmas Eve, 1951, a month after, where it happened, November 51, I got him, but he got away, but I'd done two of his brothers. And on Christmas Day, I knew there was other brothers that would come back for more. And they'd come round to where I lived at the time, Mason Street, 1951, Christmas Day, and I shot them. Great, it's a lovely Christmas. And then, in 1953, he come in once from prison, doing two years, and I'd done him again then. And then in 1955-56, done him again, and he nicked us. You worked with Billy Hill, and then you got, later got seven years for slashing his rival Jack Spot. Well, Jack Spot was an evil, terrible man. He cut untold people in his time. And his prestige was going down. And he made a list of 10 people. I was number eight. I never forgive him. I was number eight right down the bottom. I'd just come out of Broadmoor. But he decided on one at the top, a lovely man, Albert Dimes, Italian Albert. Absolute smashing fella. And for no reason, he stabbed Albert in Thrift Street. August 1955. But Albert was extremely powerful, defended himself, and come out the better of the fight out of the two. They were both arrested, 
and it's now called the fight that never was. So both Charles were wounding one another and both found not guilty. But that was the end of Spot. But what he'd done, he got hold of five young boys, 19, 20, 21, quite young, give them some money and guns to shoot Billy Hill and Albert, Albert Dimes. They couldn't keep their mouth shut and we heard about it. We just got hold of them, just give them backhanders, took the guns on them, that was it. That's why I attacked Spot. But he was evil. Bobby Warren, who is the uncle of Frank Warren, the boxing promoter, he was absolutely innocent. And Battles Rossi, Robert Rossi, Bert Rossi, Battles Rossi, also absolutely innocent. He got in four years, swore their life away. Oh, it breaks me heart now. No parole them days, no more remission or anything. Things were a lot harder. They never moaned or grumbled, naturally. They protested their innocence, but in doing their bird, I said, boys, they said, oh, don't worry, Frank, they were smashing. But absolutely innocent, both of them. Spots wore their life away.